Father, we thank you. Let's for a moment say, Lord, bless your servant. Speak through him. Just say it like that. Say, Lord, bless your servant. Speak through him. Speak through him. Speak through him. Let him declare according to your counsel. Let him declare as he sees. Give him light. Give him a revelation. In the name of Jesus. Let's pray and say, Lord, fill me with joy today. Let your joy fill my heart. Yes, I receive it. Oh, yes, Lord. We receive your joy. The outpouring of joy in our lives. Blessed be your name, everlasting Father. You are worthy to be praised. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. The Lord is good? All the time. If you believe it, can you say confident amen? Amen. All right. All right, please, can you just uh, bless somebody beside you? Greet them this morning. Say, God bless you. Good morning. Tell the person, good morning. You have come to the presence of the Lord. Good is the morning to you. All right. So let's declare the glory of the Lord. From the book of um, Colossians chapter 1, from verse 12. One to let's go. Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Amen. Amen. Father, we give you praise this morning. Lord Jesus, we honor and glorify your name. Again, we kiss the Son. That if we do homage to the Son, that's what it means. It's not an affectionate kiss. It's a bowing like kissing the hand. We kiss the Son. We bow to the Son. We believe in the Son. We are transformed by the Son. We believe his blood was shed for us on the cross. And we believe that because of him, we are reconciled to the Father. We believe that we are now children of God. We believe all these truths. This morning, as we go into your word, Lord, we receive from you insight and understanding. We receive from you direction. We receive from you healings. And we receive from you miracles. In the name of Jesus Christ. I need to say that again. This morning, we receive from him healings. And we receive from him miracles. Let's declare the word of understanding. Quickly, one, two, let's go. Give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And I'm being filled with the knowledge of his will. In all spiritual wisdom and understanding. As a result of this, I'm walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. I am pleasing him in all respects. I'm bearing fruit in every good work. And I'm increasing in the knowledge of God. Now again, I incline my ears to his word. The word is entering my heart. It is giving me light and direction. It is healing me in every area. It's making me more and more like the Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. All right, the Lord is good. Let's take our seats. Let's start this morning from uh, the book of Matthew chapter 5. I'll start from verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now notice, he left the crowd. And the disciples separated themselves from the crowd to come to the Lord. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Or blessed are the meek, the same thing. All right? Or the humble. Verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed, he said, are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, not because you are bad, okay? Because of me, because of your testimony of Jesus Christ. He said, rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. They went on to say to them in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything, except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Essentially, you have been set on a hill. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. So God has set you on the lampstand. And he gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I read up to verse 16. Let me stop reading here and continue what we began last um, uh, meeting, okay, concerning the defense in precepts, the defense in precepts. I took time out last time to remind us of the different aspects of the Word of God. We said the Word of God has five aspects, of which of the five, the two most prominent are the promises and the precepts. Of course, we mentioned other things like commandments, testimonies, and ordinances. And in our Bible discussions on Fridays, we, have, we talked about the ordinances. We listed about um, uh, five of them. I think about five. We talked about a uh, profession and constant confession. We talked about uh, baptism. We talked about the communion. Uh, also talked about the gathering together and laying on of hands. And those are the five we identified, which we discussed, Okay. Now, these are different aspects of the Word of God. Now, we, there's an expression I borrowed from Caleb some time ago when he talked about the fact that he followed the Lord fully. God first gave that testimony concerning Caleb. If you go and read Numbers chapter uh, 13 and 14, which, of course, you remember, that was when they went to, um, this was at Kadesh Barnea, when they went to go uh, and spy the land. And when they returned, they said all kinds of things about um, the land that they are not able to enter therein. But God said, but my servant, in Numbers 14, verse 24, Caleb, let me start from 22. He said, surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet put me to the test these ten times, and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers. All right? In that verse 24, but my servant, Caleb, we also know this applied to um, um, Joshua, but Caleb was picked out here. He said, but my servant Caleb, because he had a different spirit and has followed me fully. And later on, this same Caleb went to Joshua, in the book of Joshua, and told Joshua, remember, Moses, the servant of God, promised me this land because I followed the Lord my God fully. So we borrow that expression, following God fully from here. Because, you see, a lot of times people follow God partially. We were discussing this yesterday as we were discussing the Bible. A lot of people follow God partially. And that is what idolatry is. That is what traditional human religion is like. They follow God partially. What do I mean? For example, if you worship, um, well, I grew up in Western Nigeria, so I know more of the traditional worship there than I know of uh, the one in Eastern Nigeria. Okay, so let's take Western culture, Western Nigerian culture. If you worship Ogun as an example, Ogun doesn't really have anything to say about how you treat your wife. He doesn't care. He doesn't have anything to say doesn't have rules concerning marriage. Ogun never says anything about how you do your business. Do you cheat people or you don't? Ogun only has one thing to say. Where is my sacrifice? As long as you bring the sacrifice, he's okay. You can be wicked and you bring the sacrifice. It makes no difference. So the time of sacrificing, everybody goes to sacrifice to Ogun. If you are sacrificing to Shongo, the same thing. Shango will never ask you, 
that woman in your house, is she your wife? He doesn't even know. Neither does he care. Shango is only interested, did you bring the appropriate sacrifices? If you offered sacrifices wrongly, that's when you got into trouble with Shango or Ogun. Ogun has some other concerns, like <laughs> when you finish an, your wine, do you leave the bottle standing or lying down? Just in case it's passing and he wants to drink. There, there, there's, a, there's a myth around that. Okay? It's based on a true story, actually. Okay? In which, when it, you know, it was, these were human beings that were canonized. I hope you get my point. Uh, they are not, no, no, they were, they were human beings that lived there. Some of them were kings around that area. Some of them were warriors. I can't give details about who's who now. At least Shongo, I know. He was, I think, an, I think was a, it was a, the king in Oyo at a time. Yeah. No, they were human beings anyway. Yeah, so they are not um, spirits. All right, it was after they died that people, pardon me to use the word, said they were gods. It's a natural, it's, you see, that godship thing, okay, is a natural human religion. It's all over the world. We hear of Hercules. These were Greek heroes that really existed. Then they turned them to gods. They deified them. Let me use that word, not canonized now. Let me use the word deified. Just small aside. That was what they were doing. They were trying to do with uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, it wasn't strange to him. So the people came to him and said he was a god. And this is really, really small aside. Let me not spend time on it. Now, if you have ever wondered why he killed the people when Daniel survived, that was what happened. It was a, you know, like they insulted his intelligence. They came to this great king and said, you are a god. Meanwhile, he now found out later it was only a ploy to settle scores against, let me not even say with, against Daniel. He said, oh, you will say I'm a god, Abby. Now, the god of Daniel has delivered him. So the rest of you, go to the Dion's den, pray to me, let's see whether I can deliver you. So be it. Decree, seal, they kind all of them. Go in there and pray, Daniel prayed and it worked. That was why the God of Daniel was now recognized. The God who can deliver from the den of lions. Do you get what I'm saying here? So that, that's just a small aside, all right? For those who want to just know. Sometimes it's good to get these things in context. Because if you don't, you'll be wondering, why is the Bible story like that? That's what happened, all right? So now, it's, a, it's, it's across human religions, across time, across peoples, different continents, tribes, history. Human beings usually deified some of them. Okay? But where I'm going, my emphasis, let me just stick on my emphasis, is that those people never cared about your life. They cared about their sacrifices. People were afraid of them, so they learned how to appease them with sacrifices. At least when I was in junior school, we learned the, the cultures and the gods of Yoruba land. And I can't remember them giving us do's and don'ts that did not have to do directly with their worship. The do's and don'ts of our Lord Jesus Christ had little to do with what you call worship. It had to do with a lifestyle. So you hear, thou shalt not bear false witness. It had nothing to do with the temple. It had to do with your relating with your brother, your sister. So you hear things, thou shalt not steal. It had nothing to do with worship in the temple. It had to do with how you related with your neighbor. They had laws on if you found lost property, how you handled it. That didn't have anything to do with worship. It had to do with how you related with your neighbors. Most of the laws were actually with how you, had, you related with your neighbors. Very few on how you related with God directly. Your lifestyle, it comes to, let's say Christ. It tells you how to treat your wife. It tells you how to treat your children. It tells you how to treat your husband he will tell you how to d- relate with customers in your business. He will tell you how to relate with your government. Do you follow my point? He will tell you, hey, don't speak evil of the ruler of the people. He will tell you, pray for the king, for rulers, and for all those who are in authority. He gave instruction on everything. He didn't talk only about how you related with God. Like we are discussing yesterday during the Bible discussion. We are talking about daily sacrifices that we offer as priests under the new covenant. These the sacrifices, Jesus emphasized in John chapter 4, that they are not 
Because when that woman asked Jesus, again, let's just explain some of this, because some of people are reading the Bible, they don't quickly put it in the context of when it was spoken. You, you, you interpose or superimpose your own thoughts about certain words. For example, when the Bible, no, it's a small aside again. When the Bible says, you have robbed me in tithes and in what? Offerings. When pastors are talking about that offering, they say your tithe is 10%, your offering is money you give after. I said that the Bible never said so. He said, you have tithe, robbed me in tithes and in animal sacrifices. The offering there was not money. It was how you offered, and he explained. He said, you have healthy animals in your flock. But because you're about to kill this unto the Lord, you take the blind and the lame and bring it to me. It was robbing me in offerings. But you know, because modern day, offering time is what? Money giving time. When I say, you don't rob God in your offering, God never, you know, he didn't say anything like that. I'm not saying you rob God in money matters. I'm just saying that that scripture is being misused. He specifically meant animal sacrifices. Just by the way, when they used to, you know, I just said this to educate people. How they tighten on animals. How they used to tighten on animals is that you let the animals pass through and count one, two, three, four, up to ten. They take the tenth one. Now, the animals don't kill. They rush. So it's very randomized. But some people will look and say, ah, that's my strongest bull there. Remove it. If it's the tenth one, they change it. Do for one week one. That's what God called robbing me in what? Offerings. Again, it's a smaller side to help us understand the Bible. So when that woman came to Jesus and said, where do we worship? What she meant was not where do we raise our hands. Where do we pray? It was where do we present our sacrifices? Where do we present our gifts to the Lord? That's what she meant. So that's why I said our fathers worshipped in this mountain. They prayed in their homes. They gave thanks in their homes. But when it was time to present offerings, they took the animals and went to an altar. He said, but you say it's in Jerusalem. We have to go to the temple in Jerusalem. But that's not my emphasis. My emphasis is that Jesus now said, what God is looking for now is not a place of physical things with which we worship. He said, those who we worship, we worship in spirit and in truth. It is not a place, it is not with physical objects. Of course, we know it might manifest different ways. But the emphasis is that God is seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth. So that's where God, Jesus Christ, is different from other gods. So now I was talking about people following him partially. People go, they bring a tithe of stolen money. Why? It's because they are treating God like the other gods. Ogun oh, didn't care what you, where you got the animal you brought for sacrifice, as long as you brought it. You could have taken your neighbor's own. He doesn't check. He, doesn't, he didn't have the ability to. So when Christians do what they do, when they dress well going to church and dress badly going to their friends' parties, he's treating God like those other gods. He's following God partially. They are not following him fully. That's what we're saying with all of these things. How do you follow God? You follow him how? Fully. Fully. You follow him in the morning, in the afternoon, and at night. You followed him in the way you made money and the way you spend money. I hope you're getting my point. You follow him in how you treat your close friend and how you treat a stranger. You follow him in how you treat your boss and how you treat your employee. You follow him in how you treat your wife and how you treat your husband. You follow him in everything, in how you dress. You finish dressing up, you stand in front of the mirror. You're not looking to see what you think. You're stylishly checking, does the Lord approve of this look? Yes, you're checking. As I step out, who am I representing? I like the way it was quoted that John G. Lake used to do it. He said John G. Lake used to dress very nice. He wore nice suits, clean suits, very nice. What was his reason? He said, everywhere I go, I'm representing somebody. So the man will look at it to make sure he's straight, make sure he's ironed, make sure he fits in very well. Say, I'm representing somebody. Now, let's not talk about his own clothes in details, but I had the thought. He had the idea. Can I say something? 
for the word of God to bear fruit in your life, you have to treat it with seriousness. You can never shelve it. You know, like, um, okay, we are done with that word, put it on the shelf. What we need, we'll get it again. No. Once it enters your life, it must become part of you. You go into an exam hall, the word of God is with you. It's instructing you what you can do, what you can't do. You go to work, the word of God is with you. It's instructing you in what you can do, what you can't do. Now, that is what releases the power in God's word to you. Now, many of us, this is what we do. Hmm? When we are sick, we go and look for the word on healing and start declaring it. When we need money, we start looking for the word on prosperity and we start declaring it. I hope you're getting my point. When we are looking for things, we, we take a word and start talking about that word. Meanwhile, we don't realize it's not the letter, it's the spirit. Now, the power in that word will not be appropriately released except you have used the word in a particular way all the while. I hope you're getting my point. For example, you can't take the word of healing and declare it. When somebody talked to you yesterday in the office about the word on how to relate with your country, I said, I believe that one. Let's be practical. Once they leave that one, next day when you take the word of healing, the word of healing will not be activated. Because it has to be followed how? Fully. You have to show total and constant regard for that word. Otherwise, you will not be able to release the power therein when you need we have to be careful that we are not following partially. It's very important. And that's what we're teaching about the different aspects of the word of God. A lot of people just hold on to the promises. But that doesn't work. There are precepts. The thing about precepts is that you live by them constantly, every day. And last time we talked about it. All right? Now, let me just continue, just doing a small recapitulation and trying to put um, all the things together. Now, I want to continue from where I stopped. So we looked at last night about precepts that, you know, the title of this short series is The Defense in Precepts. And what do I mean by the defense in precepts? God gives you, and that's how grace works, simple things to do. That activates his power, his love in your life. The protection he has for you. You know, please, let me go over it again. We did it last time, but I need to emphasize this. When people are giving testimonies, I'm always very unhappy when some, is it, esoteric part of it is amplified. What do I mean by that? That as I was about to leave my house in the morning, the Holy Spirit began to tell me, don't go out, don't go out, don't go out. When you start like that, you make me sad. Yes. Are you saying, oh, this person talk to people who want to go out? Of course he does. He does, he does, 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 does. But most times that, I can give you many testimonies, that God has delivered people that I heard the testimony. Eh? They didn't hear anything. They made a rational decision. A lot of Christians, especially Pentecostals, end up being spooky and unreal. What is it spooky? They are scared of the way they behave. Make a decision. They do like this. I said they are hearing from heaven. Please stop now. Can I beg you people to stop that nonsense? I'm not saying you won't hear from heaven, but it's not like that. You take a few isolated ways by which prophets, prophets in the scriptures were led. They want to make it like this is constant life. It's not. Also, Chambers will say, look, you can't live on the mountain. You go to the mountain for experiences, then you come and live on the, va- in the flat plain. That Peter wanted to live on the mountain. Let's stay here. Let's build three tabernacles. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. Why do I have to go down? Jesus, the vision ended. Said, Let's go down. Let's not go and live day to day. Go and, go and talk to normal people. Go and live a normal, average, in quotes, life. But bearing in mind what you have seen on the mountain. Christians want to behave like, ah, what are we eating this morning? Let me go to the mountain. Let me go and see Moses and Elijah. The, I'll give you an example. There was some um, well-known, of course, every plane crash is international news. I hope you're getting my point. Some people are afraid of flying because they say planes crash. <laughs> Cars crash 500 times. No, 5,000 times more than planes. Okay, that's just a smaller side. So, relax. If you have to fly, fly. Don't say you might crash if you fly. If you sit at home, the roof may fall. It's the same thing. So, <laughs> leave that thing, right? <laughs> but there's one very well-known plane crash in Nigeria that happened some years ago that um, killed one of our prominent female ministers. I just want to mention it. We all know. Now, a friend of mine, not him now, 
but his staff, he headed a, was a, a very high level um, manager in, one, in a company, one build multinational in Nigeria. So they had a program in Abuja. So that day they finished. Now let's assume this other crash, and it was flying from to Port Harcourt. Assuming that crash happened on the 10th, I can't remember the date, just as an example. His own program was on the 9th. So his men who came from Port Harcourt, they wanted to relax. They wanted to relax. So, ah, who we'll eats in the hotel now on the company's, they just relax on Monday. He said, just tell them, no, 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 there's work to do, there's work to do, all of you. He ordered them to leave the program, take the last flight on the 9th, and get to, to work for the 10th. That was how they were spared from being on that flight. Because the boss just said, everybody get back to work. There's something about humility and letting them slap your face. There was one woman, if you remember that particular flight, one funny thing happened. People were seated. Then government officials arrived. They needed to get back to work, flying back to the same city. You know the way we do sometimes? Not only also, Americans, I find that they do the same thing. It makes the news once in a while how they treat passengers. So suddenly they announced that, please, everybody should go down. I said there was an issue with the plane. But actually, it was, they wanted to drop people and put the government officials. So everybody went there, decided reloading the plane. They put in the government officials first, displacing passengers who bought their tickets, who were seated, ready for takeoff. They had boarded. So by the time they finished loading, they now found that, not, of course, naturally, not everybody could get into the plane. They, said they began to apologize to them. Now, this was a testimony. I, I saw it on TV by one of the people, all right, that was displaced. They were displaced, all right, one of them. So she said there was this particular woman. She was so angry. She said, it will not happen under my watch. She pushed the aside and stomped up the steps and entered the plane and dared anybody to, anybody to remove her. So they were forced to find out where to, find out where to sit. She died. See all the people that were displaced, they live to tell the story. It was one of the people displaced that was telling us, ah, hey guys, I was on that plane. I was on that plane. Now let me put spiritual words to it. The angels of God came, evacuated us. I said, you, it's not your day to die. 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 Then they offered the woman the chance to live. And the woman used her oboju. I will show you I don't take nonsense. And she had been using, now, I don't know her, just giving her a story. I can just imagine she's been using that I don't take nonsense to badge her way around life. And God has been telling her, oh, get, try and take small nonsense now. She said, no. I can imagine her husband would say, this is the problem I always had with this woman. She's not there here. They will forget the fact that she was displaced unjustly. She's not there here. So in this life, eh, sometimes, eh, Foolishness is good. Jesus said, when they slap you on the left cheek, turn the right one. If it started with the right, turn the left. It's very counterintuitive. It's not the kind of thing that we would like to do. But Jesus said, that's how I will save your life sometimes. Please, I'm telling this story because, you see, sometimes, and I told you, there's one I saw, one that was so angry that my wife said, you have come. I said, yes, I have come. Why won't I come? This woman will say, it's good to listen to the Holy Spirit. It's good to listen to the Holy Spirit. She had a fat Bible in front of her. And I said, why are you deceiving people? You know, drop this thing. You're not supposed to be a preacher. Just sit down. You're a fool. You say, you see, it's good to listen to the Holy Spirit. What was she listening to the Holy Spirit about? Say, so one day, she was supposed to have dinner. She and her husband, they planned some things. And the man now came late. As soon as they were supposed to start by 7, he didn't get home till 8 o'clock. So she was already angry and angry and angry. The Holy Spirit now told her. The Holy Spirit now said, relax. What if something... So the Holy Spirit began to tell her. The Holy Spirit began to tell her. So the Holy Spirit said, when he comes, ask him how his day was. Don't react in anger. You know, as she, she was talking. She said, and she had one fat... You saw in the video. The Bible was huge. I was just angry. My wife said, relax. I said, sweetheart, she's deceiving women. But she doesn't know it. I said, if that was your boss in the office, would the Holy Spirit have needed to talk to you? That's where I'm going. So I said, look, if that was your boss in the office, would you have needed the Holy Spirit? Where am I going? Her testimony should not, I say boldly, 
should not have been Holy Spirit spoke to me. It should have been, I was walking in error. I was corrected. What is the error? Show honor and respect and difference to your own husband. That's all you needed. That's all you needed. Simple self-discipline would not have given the Holy Spirit a job. So you see stubborn people that God delivered from death telling you it's good to learn to hear God. You don't need to hear God. You need to just obey good manners. See, what you should have done is to obey the scripture and not start telling us how to hear the spirit. Do you follow my point? There's defense for your life, preserving your life for your progress in precepts. Just following precepts is what God uses to guide you. So if somebody breaking the rules of God, whatever he says, God says to him, don't believe. They need to say that to you again. If you see anybody breaking the rules of God, whatever the person says that God said to him or her, don't believe. Well, are you saying the person is lying? The person is deceived. Unless, of course, that thing is correction. I'll begin my point. Unless it is correction. Once somebody is breaking the rules of God, please don't follow the... Once it is clear, you say, what, how will I know? John said, you can see a brother committing a sin that is unto death. You can see a brother committing a sin that is not unto death. It's sometimes obvious. Let me give you an example. I don't need God to tell me anything about any woman. You know why? That is that should you marry this one or not marry this one? Should you have a relationship with this one or not marry a relationship with this one? You know why? I'm married. The Holy Spirit won't discuss it. He doesn't talk, it's like a, he won't tell me, bank it. He won't, he will not say anything. He won't tell me stop. He won't tell me go. He won't say anything. The only thing that will happen is an angel is waiting in front. Say, cross this line, I will kill you. There will be no discussion. So if I come to, and this, now it sounds funny, but these are things people have done. Pastors, let's not even talk about, they've come and said, God said I should leave my wife and marry this woman. Yes, they've done it. And when they are talking, you know the truth? Some of them actually heard God. Clearly. Yeah. By all the rules by which God has spoken to them in quotes before, they heard God. In case you do not know, Ahab heard from the spirit of God in quote before he went to Ramos Gilead. Because God commanded the spirit to go and deceive him. Do you need to be told again that is that same spirit that spoke to Balaam? Do you need to be told again that is that same spirit that spoke through the witch of Endor at Endor to Saul? If you know the way spirits operate. When he went the second time, God wasn't speaking again. I said, look at this foolish man. So everything just jammed in his head and he heard it clearly. Why, why am I so sure? Why, if it was God that told him go, why was an angel waiting to kill him? Don't you know a house divided against itself cannot stand? Heaven is not divided. There must be something wrong with what Balaam heard. So if anybody tells you he heard God, why breaking precepts? Don't believe the person. He's deceived. She's deceived. I've seen too many people brag on this, their ability to hear God, that for me it's an embarrassment to Christianity. That you are hearing God. Can't you see how senseless what you are doing is? My wife and I were discussing a few days ago about one particular woman married a particular man. See, let me tell you. Let me just say something to you. Eh? When it comes to marriage. If everybody tells not to marry somebody, if you marry the person, you're a mad person. No? People who love you, who know God, though. I'm not talking about clowns. Who say she's not from our village. Not from, that's not what I'm talking about. But everybody who loves you, who loves the Lord, told not to marry somebody. I don't care the vision you saw. You can't go ahead with that marriage. What should I do? Wait. The least you will do is wait. This is your stubbornness, especially when you're a woman, it's even worse. It's even worse. I told her my wife and I were talking about a woman the other day. The kind of hell she has gone through. I was like, why? One day I heard a woman speaking somewhere. He said, I know what God told me. I said, you see, this is a problem. This is a problem. After suffering for all the years, finally you divorced the guy. And he told me, God told you. Because all the rules, see, all the rules were there. And the church identified the rules. 
I said, okay, don't be silly. You can't do this. He said, God spoke to me. Uh-uh. Who, which God do you think you are dealing with? God jumped to your pastor, jumped to your senior brother, jumped to your elders in your church, jumped to your fellow ministers, jumped to your friends, and came to talk to you. You should know when the devil is talking to you now. You are a young woman. God left all this world and come, came and talks to you. Which kind of God are you hearing? I've told all you spiritual people. She, you know, I, let me say it openly. So that when you want to do spirituality, when you come near me, you will stop it. I dislike spiritual people. I don't like them. These are people you can't reason with. You cannot reason with them. I was talking to one of my brothers once. He was making some present decisions. So they, I thought we should talk. I should talk with him. He said, the Lord. I said, hey, hey, it's good. He said, me what the Lord told him. I said, if you say that again, I will end the discussion. I said, by that statement, you are telling me not to say anything. I said, so I will assume you said nothing. Let's go back to where we were before you opened your mouth and said that. I told him that. I said, please, let's go back to what I was saying before you told me this. I said, because if you say that to me, I will close this discussion and I will walk away. I said, but if you want me to keep talking, let's just wipe out the last statement you made so we can have a conversation. One of the problems I found with Christians of today, my wife and I are talking about it. They are, they are intellectually lazy. So take the scripture and use it to reason. They don't like it. That's why you tell them, let us pray for Nigeria. Hey, Kalabaka, Kalabaka. Shut up, shut up. You don't know how to pray for Nigeria. Stop blaming. The Holy Spirit is not helping you. You don't know anything. He said, before you tell them, let's pray for this brother. Say, hey, hey, Kalabaka, hey, Kalabaka. I say, Please now, can you just send me silent? Paul said, I will pray with my understanding. And I will pray in the spirit. You, the only thing you know to do is to pray in the spirit. You know what that tells you? You are not praying. You are not praying. You are not praying. They are not praying. Okay, they told me the other day. I said, Pastor, this you are saying is true. You give somebody a microphone to pray. I told I told him, I said, come to Kingdom World. You see anybody leading prayer here, they talk for 30 minutes non-stop, and you can understand everything they are saying. They stand 30 minutes. Let's pray for Nigeria. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Lord said, it is written. That's what they will tell you. Eh? When is Jonathan? You can't even catch up. <laughs> we had to go and beg and say, Jonathan, please slow down. We have to follow you. As he's giving you what Zachariah is saying, he's telling you what Sam is saying, he's telling you what Jesus said, what Peter said, what John. Ah! I said, Jonah, wait now, please now. <laughs> Did you get my point? Yes. No, Reverend, you know, you can't call him, say, Oh God, Jonah, please. Eh? The Lord will bless you. Let's go down. It's not like they don't know how to speak in tongues. Jonathan can remove your head with tongues too. But when they stand up, everybody has to be able to follow them. I will say it. Some people may not like it. So this noise we make in church is not prayer. You know, we behave as if the Holy Spirit is the most disordered creature in the universe. One day somebody was praying. I want to tell you, yeah, yeah. I said, if you were groaning, drop the mic. Why are you groaning to the microphone? You are a noisemaker. The densest, heaviest groaner in scripture is Jesus Christ. Yet he was walking with people to the tomb of Lazarus. They heard nothing. The Bible says he stirred it up within himself. He groaned within himself. He just wasn't talking to anybody. You look in his direction. <clears throat> the knee was deep into something. You go and put microphone. You put noise. Bang, 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 bang. Wow. Is it a rock concert you are doing? <laughs> now see the lead, person leading, trying to outshout the person on the keyboard. And that one decides to increase. Wow, 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 wow. They'll be running up and down like loose chicken. That you ch- no. know what pains me? We say it's the Holy Spirit. And I say to you, it is not. I'm begging Christians. Catherine Kuma married a man. Her friend said, don't. Her senior said, don't. Her family said, don't. They said, ah, okay, okay. okay. Finally, the day of the wedding, she realized she had missed it. She had nowhere to go. Everybody parked and left her in the marriage. Even God did. Holy Spirit left her. Everybody left her. She married that man for these six or seven years of absolute silence from heaven. Apart from the rebuke of the Spirit. Because the rule was clear. 
This man was married. He had two children. Then you came into his life. Then he and his wife quarreled. And you are claiming that the man said his wife left him. People said, no, the wife didn't leave him. You drove her away. His relationship with you drove her away. Did he seek reconciliation with her? No, he wanted to marry you. And you married him. So the whole church said, her closest friend said, oh girl, I'm sorry. She went for a wedding, no, no friend. Any wedding you are going to, especially a woman, no friend, they there. No pastor, they there. People that have known you for the last 10 years, they didn't come. They refused to show up. You married wrongly. Today's was Saturday. The wedding is at 10. We are preaching at 9. Don't go. Oh girl, don't go. In case you are hearing this. Say, Pastor, it's, too late. it's not too late. Oh. I know one guy in Lagos. I didn't meet him personally. I saw his friends talking about it. They did traditional wedding on Saturday, Friday night. Saturday morning. In, this is Western Nigeria, so they call it engagement. They don't call it traditional marriage. Saturday morning. The guest father called her. Sit down. You are not going. The guest father said, look, look, I've tried. I followed you guys this far. But the final one, I will not do. You are not going. So they sent a message to the guy. Your bride is not coming. He, their guests came. Good enough. One of those churches, it was one of those churches where they do like five, six weddings as they go. So at least they saw a wedding to attend. <laughs> but the one they came for, the guy telling us the story. So he said that the girl didn't quarrel with her father. He said, How do I, yeah, I know. He said, because Sunday service she went. If she was fighting, she would have the vex. Her father sat her down and talked to her. See, when I was going to get married, I told my wife something. If my father objected, I would listen. Not that I said I would just not marry you, but I will pause. Why? It was not his character. Do you get my point? I was watching that for what he would say. When I told him I wanted to get married, he said, oh, that's good. It's about time. Met my wife. was very happy to see her. Greeted her very well. Dashed her money. That's the culture there. It takes more money for, you know, that, you know. I said the man, I said, um, I said, I will have waited. Not because of any other thing that I know him. He was not that type. So if you can bring him to the point where he will say no, we we'll have to go and find out. I'll go and get microscope, spiritual, and check you again. Say, so be like, say, Jezebel. <laughs> like, because, because this man, no, he's not his character. <laughs> or some just go do a boju. I don't care what all you have to say. You will soon care. You, it is a matter of time. You will care. You go care. You, 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 will, you will soon care. Catherine Kuhlman, six years of spiritual deadness. God said, as far as I'm concerned, first, your earthly father didn't give you out. Me, I did not give you out. So if nobody gave you out, you are not. Others of you are elope masters. You are single. I don't know how many children you have. You are single. If by yourself, you gave yourself to a man, you are not married. Stop fooling yourself. Hey, you are not married. Because this is the rule. They marry the men, and they are given in marriage, the women. Who gave you? Your husband is a thief. The pretending husband is not married. And let me tell you people something here. Eh? Until a man disowns his daughter, hmm? you cannot give her out in marriage on his behalf. Let me tell you something about Christianity. Sometimes we suffer for righteousness sake. So people don't want to suffer. Your father says no. You know what no means? No. You know what you will do? You will call your uncles. You will call your brothers. You will send your pastor. They have to beg him to say yes. Some people, their pastor will not be the one to walk them down the aisle. Is he your father? He says, my father in the Lord. I don't even know how to answer that one. <laughs> but if your earthly father disowns you, then another father has to adopt you. Then God gives him the right. Until that one does, there's nothing you can do. There's one lady, I know this. Well, I know, there's a lady we know, but the one that happened to is her elder sister. So it's not a fast, it's their family story. Her father is a Muslim. And I wanted to you do them clean. You know this kind of, all of you are going to church. You didn't follow me to mosque. I'm waiting for you in front. And he had a lot of girls. I don't know whether he had sons or not, but he had a lot of girls. So the eldest girl wanted to marry Went and told the father. The father said, no problem. 
But you will wait inside the mosque. The girl said, Daddy, which one kind which kind thing with this one now? You know I'm not a Muslim. You know I go to church. Hey, the father said, I don't care. You are coming to the mosque. Now, this is what people normally do with wisdom. Now, I'm not saying it is bad. I'm not saying it's good, but let's just say the guy will go and look for one name for the day. They call him Abdullah. Because when you come to church, they're not going to call you Nicholas. When you come to the mosque, they're not going to call you Nicholas. They're going to call you names like uh, Mufutao. You know? <laughs> Abdullah. <laughs> Ramon. Are you getting my point? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Mubarak. You have to find your name. So, what people do, you know, I, I, I grew up I'm from Western Nigeria, so if you're in Ebola, you won't see much of this. But in Western Nigeria, it's thoroughly mixed. They are half Christians, half Muslims. So, and then they, they, they intermarry a lot. They, so, so, you see it. The guy said, so We are going to, so what will be your name? I'll be Ahmed. You know, you are just Ahmed. <laughs> yes. After a wedding, you can remove the name. Yeah. They told this lady, okay, let your husband to be your groom do that. She said no. The guy said no, that we are Christians, we intend to stay like that. And the father said, leave it now. Year one, they didn't marry. Year two, they could not marry. How many years? Can you remember? Well, it was a long time, ago, not two days ago. They want this matter. What comes to my mind is like four years. But I'm not very sure. The girl stuck to her grounds. She, of course, what you do, you don't go to your father at some time and say, I won't come, I will not come. Even God will not wait you if you do like that. You go and be begging. Enter, you enter his room, your knees on the ground. You will cry, even if you are not feeling sorrowful. Just before you go, you put sorrow in your eyes. You know what they call sorrow? Enter the table, you call my daddy, my daddy, my daddy, your daughter is crying. <laughs> And you will cry. You, will, where you, will? you must cry. Then you go and bring some of your notorious aunties who your father respects and pray that they are on your side. Because some of them, when they reach there, they turn against you. He won't go kill on the two men. They will be looking like, Auntie, he's a fire. Look for the world that you are sure will help you. Finally, the, when the man saw that this girl was not going to budge, you know what he did? He permitted them to go, but he said he wasn't going to come. And the girl said, that's not a problem. Do you give the permission? He said, yes. Appoint one of your brothers, so we go. The father appointed one of his brothers. He said, well, no, that's not a problem. You come to church. So the father didn't come to church. Who gives this girl out in marriage? It was her uncle. But he was acting on the father's behalf. He had the father's authority. Now, the story about it is that I asked, because his younger sister we're talking to. So when they asked his sister, you know, the Bible says faith does what? Works how? How does faith work? I'm not talking about precepts. All this is what I'm saying. Only one thing empowered that girl. She said, I have many younger sisters. To call the, the, um, to call the husband Oman Farouk for two days was not her problem. Farouk, let's go to for wedding. In all honesty, okay, let me not say some people misunderstand. It was not really a fantastic big deal. If there's nothing, God will not punish them. Because Farouk is a name. There are many Christians called Farouk. Ah, there are many. Yes, there are many called, Christians called Muhammad, Abdullah. You know, uh-huh. Smaila, Bin Laden. There are so many names that. Christians be, <laughs> yeah. But what she said, she was the oldest. That's why I told the story of how many girls are in the family and her position. She was the oldest. He said, "All my sis- younger sisters are also Christians. This battle has to be fought once and for all." So the girl, that lady, that's our friend. Our wedding day, my wife and I were there. You see one group of Islamic women on this side. Christian women on this side, everybody came for the wedding. And they wedded in a church. And it was not a problem. Why I, tell, I told the story is simply because you see how they went about it. They didn't just pack their bag and walk away. They fought the battle. There was one, my pastor in Lagos then told us, that one, I feared. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't have understanding before that time. 
So I felt that. What is it? Ah, you know, you know, go green. Ah, give me game. I better leave that thing. You know that kind of attitude. That's what. <laughs> that was what we were thinking. Then one day I was in church. Pastor was preaching, and described the story of this particular girl. Her own was seven years. Yeah, she wanted to marry one guy. Her father said no. Seven years. Her father said no. The guy didn't go away. She didn't go away. Her father, ah, see. The problem is he took an axe and hung it around his neck, which means anogogri. The father refused. The girl did everything. The father refused. Huh? But I don't know the reasons why she couldn't change her mind. I don't know why. She waited. Christian man, Christian woman. So one day she now prayed. I said, God, hmm? I'm tired. But it didn't cross her mind. She could go and marry without the man's consent. That's where I'm going. So in the seventh year, she said the Holy Spirit told her something. So she went to her father, knelt down, and told the man, okay, fine. Whatever you say is final. Give me your last word. If you say no, I'm going to tell him I'm not marrying him again. The seventh year, the father looked at her, said, pick a date, get back to me. When I heard that story in church, I, I couldn't take it. I went and met pastor. Pastor, don't sir. Please, oh. I, no, it, it went against everything I understood. But it's what he said that I want to refer to for you today. I said, how can, he said, everybody will go through a major test in life. That was her own test. Fear, catch me. He said, in this life, you will pass through a test. He said, that was her own test. I have not forgotten that until today. He said, everybody will go through a major test in life. See, let me tell you, the way you will not escape the time of your testing is precepts. God will hedge you in with certain precepts you can't break. We just say, see, this line you can't cross it. This line you can't cross it. See, but what is going on here is not right. You'll be silent. You'll be silent. See, go if you want to go. They want to go, you see the line of precepts. But this line cannot be crossed. You go this way, you see the line of precepts. But this line cannot be crossed. You go this way, ah. So he boxes you in, what not with a specific instruction, with that every way you have to get out is blocked with precepts. And that's what will save you. I told you, I've given the testimony many, many, many times. Jonathan's second election against Buhari, we heard all kinds of news. Now, please, I'm not saying this as being true, but that's what we heard. They said there were weapons all over the place. The headsmen are infiltrated everywhere. The Ibuari lost that election. There was going to be war. And Buari had made a misstatement, if you remember, about baboons and uh, dogs or something swimming in their own blood. Remember that? Why? Because he was convinced he won the previous one, but was rigged out. Now, just for your information, he did not. That previous election, good Lord Jonathan won it. Fair and square. But because he was surrounded only by his own people that voted for him, it's always like that. You believe that we won, we were rigged out. Good luck, Jonathan won that first election fair and square. All he needed to do was look at the maps. And he collected 25% in most northern states because there were enough people to vote for him. And what you need to win in Nigeria is 25% in many states. Everybody knows it was a fair and sc- I mean, Jonathan said, please don't rig for me. I heard him say it that time. He said, nobody should rig for me. It was God's time. I'm not saying there was no irregularities, but he won. So the next, of course, there was riots that time. Some coppers were killed in some states. Yeah. So because they felt this is our savior who we have now seen couldn't save anybody. Yeah, we gave him eight years. Did he save you? Did he save me? Did he save anybody? It wasn't like a bad man. That's just human beings for you. They can't save nobody. They can't save anybody. Four years later, another round of election came. The same te- worst tension was now in the air. This time around, political manipulations, Southwest had shifted. Them, you know, you know, um, it was it ACN, whatever. Anyway, they had shifted. So tension everywhere. The power of incumbency. Not Enugu began to increase in size. Why? People were running away, coming to drop family here, everything. And my friend was a pastor in Sokoto, Pastor Courage. That's where I'm going. It's the story I want to tell. 
Yeah? Everybody begged him. In-laws begged him. Give us your wife and your children. Come, just come and spend some time in the south. He will call me. He said, what will I tell the church people? How many of them can I carry to this house? Some of you will be advising people who are walking by faith. Stop, oh. Me, I, I was on my knees, I was, oh. Because he, the precepts he was operating by, they were sound. He said, I'm a shepherd over people. I will not abandon them the time of distress for my own safety. So friends called him from Lagos. We are sending you tickets for your wife, for your children. He said, send tickets for everybody. I will send them. But if you just want my wife and children, I'm sorry I can't do it. He said, there are many wives here. There are many children. Don't they count? Yeah, that's what he did. Everybody was tired. He was with me in our Lecture was on Saturday. This was Wednesday. That Tuesday or Wednesday. One of our brothers died went for the burial. So they had to do, they wanted to do the burial because before the election. So we did it on like Tuesday, Wednesday that about. Wednesday I went home to go and see my mom. He headed for Abuja. He said, I have to be back home before election. People are running. He said, I'm going back home. Where I'm going is, God didn't say to him, my son, thou shalt not go anywhere. We're well, just precepts. It's okay, okay. What do I tell the church people? What? Okay, I've taken my wife and my children. What am I saying to them? There's a man I read the story inside the book. I think the book that shaped civilization. One of the, it's an Indian man. All right? Can't remember the exact title of the book. The man says something. It was well to decide to move to rural India. If you ever watched um, Shole, I think it's Shole, you know rural India has bandits. They rule. Like you have mafia people ruling rural Italy. Yes. So he moved to the middle of them and started living there. And they decided they were going to do him bad things. One day, they came to their, his home. He wasn't around. They kidnapped his father. They brought a knife that they were going to remove. No, the, the father was there. He said they were going to remove his eyes to punish him. The man said, the father begged them and promised to clear all his life savings and give them if they just leave his eyes and leave him alive. Give them. He said, my father is the man of his word. Next day, he went to the bank, cleared all the money he had and dropped it somewhere for them. Ah. Because he was helping people. These are oppressed people was helping them get out of under the oppression of the bandits and all the local lords and all of that. And that's why they wanted to kill him. But the Jews were spreading around. So they said, Se- security is not going to help. You know, do you hear my point? You live in the midst of bandits. Wh- which, which security do you want to use? So all he had was prayer. He's a, he's a Christian. In fact, he said one day, he said that the head bandit there was looking for him. The head, um, the, 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 the mafia boss. So he went to the mafia boss's house and knocked. They opened it. He went in. I said, they say you are looking for me. Here I am. You know, he entered the midst of armed men in the den of the big criminal of the society. He said, I heard you are looking for me. There's no need to look. I have come. That one said, no, 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 no. Ah, no, why will I be looking for you? That one was like, no, 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 come back. You sure you're not looking for me? He said, no, I'm not looking for you. I can go, right? Nay, nay, thank you very much. <laughs> They're not looking for you. They're not looking for you. Don't look for you. I thought you can go where you want to go. Thank you. The guy left. <laughs> no, God defended that man. Now, this is where I'm going with the story. So, some people now heard some aid workers, American aid workers. Now, but let's make a long story short. You know, he was with his wife. So, one day he called his wife. I know how bad things are. I don't want to force you to do anything. If you want to relocate back to the city, I will let you go. So don't feel bad. Don't feel under compulsion to stay with me. You can go back if you want to. I'll be coming to see you. But me, I have to stay. This is the work of God for me. All right? He was the kind of missionary. So the wife said, okay, let me pray. So she prayed for a few days, came and met her husband. And said, it's for better for us. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. Only death can separate us. So the husband said, fine. So the wife stayed with him, no protection, no security, nothing, just living where these criminals were ruling. You know the way God, well, I'm talking about precepts. The woman didn't hear the voice of the Spirit, just followed some scriptures. Say, this is my husband, I will die with him. You know, that's what Peter and Co. said. 
Jesus said, let's go back and raise Lazarus. I'm going to minister to Lazarus. Lazarus is asleep. He said, hey, Oga, which can't sleep with that? Don't they have people in the house that can't wake him? But Peter said, if he's asleep, he's good. <laughs> now, <laughs> he will soon wake up. Jesus said, he was so deaf. I'm mean, the guy is dead. I want to go and raise him up. I said sleep because he will wake up. They looked at each other. Please, I've told you, stop calling Thomas, doubting Thomas. He's faithful Thomas. Thomas said, he wants to die. Let's go and die with him. So all of them told everybody, bye-bye. I love you. It was nice knowing you. Kissed everybody. I said, Jesus is different. They just follow up for back like this. Eh? They will kill us to get. They gave up. They knew they were going to die. That's where I'm going. They said, let us go and die with him. This woman said, let me go and die with my husband. What she did not know. Is that the man's news has spread. And some American missionaries wanted to come and help him. And they were women. So people said, look, how can you go to that dangerous area? They said, well, it's mission work now. And they said, no, it's dangerous. So the people said, let them go and pray. So they also prayed and came with one conclusion. They said, let's watch. If his wife stays with him, we will go. So one day they observed, maybe they got information. His wife, you know, the wife just joined him or she's not leaving. She's not leaving. They said, no, two women. They packed, came to the place. Hello, I'm so and so person. We are missionaries from America. We heard of what you are doing. We believe that God wants us to come and help you. So they entered the compound, they started living there. You know what the bandits heard? That the CIA has spent sent spies. That please, oh, I don't want American Wahala. They came, made peace, and began to protect them. That because in their mind, if anything happens, it's American trouble. Who, no, let's be honest. Who wants American's trouble? <laughs> you know, that's how God protected the whole, everybody. The bandits now became their protectors. Why did they get there? The Holy Spirit spoke to nobody. He prompted precepts in their hearts. The woman just said, listen, you are my husband. I will die with you. Those ones observed and said, if the wife can stay, it's good enough for us. They went there. And God made them to hear a rumor. They heard a rumor. And they said, the Americans have sent their spies. They want to trap us. They are looking for occasion to have war with us. So the chief mafia boss there said, Everybody, make sure nothing happens to that man or any of those three women. And they said, yes, sir. They began to protect them. There's defense in what? Precepts. That's what I'm talking about. I was telling you that God doesn't tell me about women. This woman is good. She is not good. God said, what do you think I saying? If I start praying, I want to know whether this woman is, will be a good wife. God said, for who? Your son? Because if it is for you, I, I'm not even going to do this. So, then when you keep on insisting God should talk on things he doesn't want to talk about, Satan will talk. Satan will come and say, because, like I was telling you, one particular man, he had uh, five or six children. This is in America. One day he prayed and prayed and prayed and said, God said he should divorce his wife and go and marry another woman. He said, my friend, he knows the man. He called me and said, bank, you see what I'm seeing in this America. He said, this man has like five or six children that he said God said to him. So before you come and start harassing that God told me, go and check. God won't tell you anything until all the precepts have been exhausted. Because you don't know everything. That's what James meant when he said, if anyone lacks wisdom, if anyone lacks wisdom, there are troubles you won't get into. Because he just said, he's my senior, I can't answer him. That is, you, that is, the, the guy is wrong. He's in your office. And he's like, no, he says, my God. I can't talk to him like that. There's no other thing, no. That small line prevents trouble. There's one I heard the story. In Abuja here, also one big construction firm, which we all know. <laughs> it's good to know. See, in life, you must have common sense. Common wisdom. You know, there's common wisdom. They're not deep. They're just common sense. It was a big construction firm. Then one day, he was like an assistant, a deputy manager of some sort. So one day, the manager either retired or resigned or was transferred. Now, that manager was a European because this is a multinational company. So he just assumed 
that being the deputy, what will happen? They will promote him. So he was feeling cool with himself. Manager loading. Except that as they took away manager somewhere else, they brought another manager from somewhere else and put above him to occupy the position they didn't promote him. In this life, you need humility. What did I say? Humility. humility is not when they put it in your right place. That's not humility. You can't be humble if you're in the right place. <laughs> humility is when they put you where you think is lower than where you should be. That's humility. Because many of us don't realize that we're working in pride. We think, like, like somebody said, pride is one sin that the committer, can I use that word? The sinner does not feel guilty of. But once you can feel guilty, you have left it. This man, in his own case, he was so angry. See, the Bible, they don't rush away from the presence of a king. Calm your soul down. He was so angry, took paper and resigned. Now, why? Because he felt this is injustice. He deserves that put. Now, you don't know what you deserve. Next point. You can never assess what you, de- what you deserve. You don't know. I hope you're getting my point. Even Jesus said, when you enter a place, go and take the lower seat. Because you may think you are the most important person. More important people than you are coming. You know? There are places where you go. You say, yes, I'm sitting up pastor. Then they bring a bishop. <laughs> you know bishop was coming. Then you think you are the senior bishop. Then they go and invite the archbishop. And they didn't tell you ahead of time. And in case, okay, at least I'm the archbishop. You won't know that the pope may visit Nigeria during that visit. And if, what, what, okay, what, what if I'm the Pope? What if Jesus wants to come himself? What will you now do now? <laughs> so the Bible says, just go, take a low chair, let them carry you up front. That's really humility. Just put yourself down. Just relax. So, this man refused to do that. He resigned. Now, what are the precepts he broke? Number one, you can't assess yourself. You don't know what you deserve. And then, for goodness sake, this is not your father's property. Your father does not own the company. It's not your family property. The owners have a right to put anybody they like and call the person manager, and the person will give you all the work to do, and that he will take all the credit. I hope you know you don't need credit in your life. Do you get my point? You don't need credit. What are you doing with the credit? Only one man did something to me. <laughs> was supposed to do something for some students. So I fought hard, fought hard. It was a leave this thing, leave this thing. I, I said no. Finally, they awarded the, the award to that particular student. So the guy realized what had happened. He said, ha, I always defend the truth. He went around telling everybody how he fought to make sure that that thing worked. Too. I was looking at him like, what? You were one of those who opposed me now. Do you know what? I didn't say anything to him. I didn't say a word. <laughs> so my wife said, why, why didn't you say anything? I said, for what purpose? The thing I wanted done had been done. The credit, I don't need it. What I did not know was that some people observed what happened. They saw the fight. One day I was in my office, a young man knocked. Hello, sir. Good afternoon, sir. I came to greet you. Ah, well, hey, how are you? Congrats for this. Yes, sir, you see, I heard what, how much you fought. Oh, you heard? Who told? No, like, I went and told my wife, oh, the guy actually heard. He came to my office to come and say thank you. And God says in my heart, the guy who was going around saying, ah, you know, you know how I make sure I stand behind the truth? He didn't go to tell him anything. Because God leaks the truth. That's what David meant when he said that God will vindicate me. It is God that can vindicate you. Don't go around and don't fight for anything that you say, this is my right. You don't have a right. The man, he got angry. He resigned. And God said, fine, I need to cure you of this, your pride. And did not get another job. Or oh, you didn't get another job. See, let me tell you, resignation is something you just do, like you vex. They know they take vex, resign. No? See, let me tell you, they know they take vex, resign. What did I say? You resign with a calm head. You will decide that it's time to go. And I don't mean it's time to go as in a vex. In fact, you ask people. Ask your friends. Ask your relatives. That's close people. Ask your brothers. And please, I was thinking of resigning. They will ask you why. You will explain. They will say, let us, let us go and pray about it. Please remember to ask them, when will you finish praying about it? Because some of these people will just go. <laughs> I'm telling you. Please seek counsel. Even go to your boss and say, sir, I was thinking of resigning. Please, what do you have to say? 
Don't just get on your put just put pen to paper. And don't threaten your boss. I remember one young man that threatened my wife one time. If I remember a number of them. He threatened the person who controlled the, the company they were doing then. She's abroad. So they forwarded the letter. It just replied, Your resignation is accepted. Are you crazy? How can you dare your boss? They didn't pay him full salary for certain reasons. Because he didn't do, you know, they had performance indices. He didn't meet the marks. So instead of him to say, ah, what happened? Please do. Oh. He was using his own need to determine what the company should do. That they didn't know how much his rent is almost due. Whose problem is that? Excuse me, your rent is due. How does that concern the company? The company employed you to make money, to help them run their business. They didn't employ you to pay your rent. That's how one of our brothers used to have a company and they didn't go here. His staff misbehaved badly, so he sacked the guy. The guy came and said, sir, you can't sack me now. The guy said, why not? He said, my rent is due next week. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. The guy actually said, you can't sack me now. My, neck is, my rent is due. <laughs> this guy like, what is wrong with you? Who cares about your rent? You're not doing the work. I'm not making money on you. Your presence here is not blessing our company. Are you telling me your rent is due? Like I told my wife then that, he wrote a letter, I saw the letter to the company, say, that they better pay the balance of his salary. I'm telling you. You know, this my wife is very kind. I don't know. So she wanted the letter to the lady. That one just replied. So your resignation is accepted. Hand over the company properties. And I just said, that's fine. My wife was like, my husband, I know this guy is broke. She was looking for how to, come, come, let's ne- And what was her reason? This guy is broke. He can't afford. He can't afford this kind of pride. <laughs> yeah, no, honestly. She, 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 that you can't afford. No, to be proud, you have to be able to afford it. You know, I give you some proverb from Western Nigeria. Eh? And did I, oh, have you heard this one before? Please, can I let me give it? Okay. Okay, they have a proverb in Western Nigeria. They said if you are too small to reject a kind of you know, suffering or oppression. He said, if you reject it, you will sign up for a bigger one. Let me give, okay, I'll give you a practical example. You have a landlord. Hmm? You don't have your own house. The landlord lives in the same building. Do you understand? Your rent is not too high. You can manage to pay. The man now comes one day and tells him, who packed this jalopy here? And it's your car he's talking about. And you come and say, my car is not jalopy, you are an idiot. You don't say such things unless you, you've almost finished your own house. <laughs> Just go there and say, ah, Ogalano, good morning. Ah, he said, God will prosper us. You take your car and move it. The man may have been joking. And even if he wasn't joking, do you want to be homeless? Are you crazy? <laughs> do you want to be homeless? He will just move the car and say, ah, sir, where do we park it? In the morning, you come and say, ah, Ogabe, let me move my jalopy so we can go out. You know why? He's a landlord and his rent is not high. <laughs> do you get my point? You just gauge the whole thing. But in your mind, then one day, when God now moves to another house, you now come and say, ah, sir, God has replaced my jalopy with a Bugatti, but I shall park it in the other apartment. Until then, Brethren, drink humble water. You know, like fetch water that has humility inside it. Drink it. Say, nobody can talk to me like that. Why not? Why? Some of you, eh, this is your really a raising shoulder. God will send soldier your way. The guy will slap you first before he asks you what happened. According to Alibaba, you will go home. He says there are some slaps you get. It turns you to a, to a, to a guru. Start meditating. Then they will slap you, you will go. You know, then they will slap you. Say, wait, wait, what? You want to fight. Say, there's something they will give you. Go. You will leave and say, what exactly did I say? <laughs> okay. He said, you will start meditating. You become a guru. <laughs> this guy got up, got angry, resigned from that company, did not get another job. It was his relative that was telling us the story. A pastor in Enugu. So they went to visit him. He was living in an uncompleted building with wood 
they just knocked wood on the window frame so that against the elements, he had nowhere to stay. I know the one, Apostle, I told the story of one man, say, <laughs> winner's pastor. <laughs> Bishop, we used to say things like, I don't need anybody. I don't need all of you. When God called me, didn't call any of you. You know the way Bishop talks. He too went, 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 to, went to church. <laughs> he said, I don't need anybody. I don't need all of you. Next Sunday, nobody come to church. <laughs> He came to church, there was nobody. So he went up. No, he's not a winner's pastor. He's a pastor, you know. Who, who, uh, yeah, he, you know, yes, that's uh, affiliated to Bishop, you know. He's his mentor. So when I met Bishop, see what he have for. Bishop, they go back to church. Tell them you need them. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them you need them. <laughs> see, you now I'll give you a proverb from Western Nigeria. They have another proverb. They said the old man knows what he has eaten. When they said this one will be enough, you want to save an old man food. He said, no, no, I just need small salad and one half piece of chicken. <laughs> he said, don't copy the man. No. He knows what he has eaten. I saw one joke. One body said that, uh, no, he clipped something from one of these motivational speakers. If you want to be rich, do what rich men do. One guy said, I tried. I drank coffee and a slice of bread and I went to construction site. I almost died. <laughs> The Lord is good. Where am I going? The guy was making my, I don't need anybody because Bishop said it. They said, we will let you know you are not Bishop Edipo. He came to service. There was nobody in church. So he went to Bishop. Bishop said, go back and tell them, I need all of you. After all, we are all brethren. (laughs) The Lord is good. I'm talking about the difference in precepts. Precepts will head you in. Precepts will not let you live before your time. I hope you're getting my point. Please let me say it again. I began began to emphasize that. Don't magnify this fake spirituality. That's why I said to you when I hear some testimonies, they may be true in that person's life. I'm not saying they're not true. But I feel bad. I've heard people say things like, um, they became rich because they learned to hear the Holy Spirit. Yes. And people are now trying to hear the Holy Spirit. Why? They want to be rich. But they've broken one major precept. If you want to be rich, you will pass through many hurtful loss and pierce yourself through with many sorrows. The man who listened to the Holy Spirit was doing his business, peradventure. He was just going through life. Occasionally we get to, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Because now he will get to crossroads. And he needs to make a decision. And then he will reason. Now, can I say something again? Be careful when you are following other people's testimonies. Be very careful. Because there are so many things they don't tell you. Not because they are evil, but they don't even know to tell. That's one. Number two, their words don't always mean what you think they mean. Many times if I tell you, my spirit, no, the Holy Spirit now said to me, if you know something I often do, I said, now I know it was the Holy Spirit. If you know that, I often say that. Because when it happened, it was not the Holy Spirit, it was my thought. It was an idea. Like the testimony I give when I went to pray and said, God, I'm not, this is biochemistry, this, which is advanced organic chemistry, that's all it is. He's not flowing. A number of thoughts came to my mind. You've learned the power of the tongue. Why do you keep saying it's volatile? So it was easy for me to receive. Stop saying it is volatile. I did not say at that time the Holy Spirit told me. I was just corrected concerning what I was not supposed to be doing. The next point I said, read it. You're a student. It's not going to enter your head from the Spirit. You must read. It will, if the Spirit wants to help you, pushing it through the books. Read. There's another one that happened to me later in life. I've told the story, but I don't tell that one much. The instruction the Holy Spirit gave was, you're a student. You don't go to a class at 8. I don't, you know, there are times you just wake up, you just create a bad habit. I just created a bad habit that I beg. I can't wake up until I wake up. <laughs> you know what that means? If I wake up in the morning, I'm feeling groggy, I go back to sleep. The habit was so bad, one day we had a test in class. 
They had started. I wasn't in class. I remember. End of posting tests in ophthalmology. They had started. My guys were writing tests. My friend looked at me. Looked for me. He didn't find me. So he rushed his test. He rushed it. Submitted and started running to the hostel. He said, I know this boy. He's sitting in the hostel. At that time, I had my coat. I had my bag. I was just coming. So as he ran downstairs, he saw me. Come on, get inside. What? Test has begun. Are you serious? I ran upstairs. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Why are you just coming? That's besides the point, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. I didn't say that exactly, but what I mean is that. Please, can I have my paper? Can I have my paper? She handed me the paper. I went to sit down. I started writing. I, you know, I created a habit for no reason. The guy who came to look for me, we were partners in crime. That day, something just happened that made him get there. <laughs> Two of us, we had that bad. You know, students will just get to a point and just develop one bad thing. So, it was that time we're now going for exam. And another very boring subject. I went to pray. Again, it was just correction. Be a student. So, why can you not be in class by 8 o'clock? So, I said, ah, it's a bad thing. I said, Lord, I'm very sorry. I started going to class by 8. So, when I'm telling the stories, I will now tell you, the Holy Spirit said to me. But when it was happening, I didn't say that to anybody. It was years later, as I began to learn, I began to understand. And I now go back in retrospect and say, oh, that was God correcting. Correcting. It was correction. So when you're following people's testimonies, you have to be careful. I remember one day, one of our brothers was preaching, eh? Pastor Peter. He said, the Holy Spirit now said, then at the point in time, he stopped and said, oh, when I say Holy Spirit, I meant scripture also. How many people remember that day? He has spoken for hours before suddenly he said, let me correct something. Else. It was what I had read in the Bible that came up back to me that I'm telling you is the Holy Spirit. Though. That is why you have to be very careful when you are following testimonies. The man said, he said the man became rich because he learned, he learned to be led by the Spirit. What you may not know is that nine out of ten, no. Okay, let's just say nine. Nine out of ten decisions he made were not made by that so-called Holy Spirit of yours. It was made by his rational application of business principles and biblical precepts that he had learned over time. You want to use every decision. You want to make every decision after. There's this investment we want to make. Uh, what will happen? I said, okay, so if you put your money in, we'll be giving you 25% every month because we have this way of recycling gold mine into platinum mines and diving into petroleum and marketing the stock market. So that, what I've said now means what? <laughs> nothing, nothing. They tell you that they are trading crypto. They have a special algorithm for trading crypto. So what does that mean? They are going to give you, if you give them 100,000 naira, every month they'll be giving you 20, 25,000 naira guaranteed. And you give them your money. No, before you give them, you say, let me go and pray, let me go and pray. Now, let me tell you, if you ever hear what I've said, don't pray. What did I say? Don't pray. Don't pray. You know what you do? Tell them, get out. <laughs> tell them, get out. See, if you can cure yourself of the love of money, a lot of troubles will never come to you. Just let them get out. Why do you say get out? The precept is this is quick gain. I don't do, I don't do quick gain. There are little things God has helped us understand in life. A man like Warren Buffett. Buffett tells you, listen, listen, listen. Hmm? Any business you are doing that I cannot explain to my mother, I don't put my money. Now, let me explain. This man is the greatest investor of all time. There's no investor in history that I'm aware of, that's ranked like Warren Buffett. They call him the sage of Omaha. The oracle of Omaha. He's called the sage. The man knows. Look, I, I stopped monitoring some of his clips. He speaks wisdom, financial wisdom. And one thing you notice about him is that he's never in a hurry to make money. Never. Uh, if you know business, you hear of the dot-com bubble. That happened then in the 80s, late 80s, into early 90s. When everything ended with, ended with dot com, people put a lot of money into it. You know, Warren Buffett said, Warren Buffett didn't lose one cobble. He didn't lose a dime. Why? He didn't invest mo- in money. So the young men couldn't explain to him what they were doing. 
People lost billions. He didn't lose a dime. What was his logic? He said, I have to be able to tell my mother what you do. And so they couldn't explain to him enough to convince his mother. He said, leave that thing. Yet, at a point in time, he was the richest man in the world. He's always top ten. To the guy, if his money, he has two, and he's an old man now. Very, in fact, his partner died, Charlie. Charlie died a few months ago. When I say Charlie, Charlie was 90 something. And when you hear people like Charlie, and this one, they're shouting crypto, 50 cobble. He said it will come, it will not have a good end. Yeah, all this cryptocurrency they are talking about. Both him and Charlie said it will not come to a good end. He said, if you dash me $14 billion worth of cryptocurrency, he said, I won't take it from you. He said, why? Because the only money I can get out of it is when I sell it back to you. He said, how does it make sense? He said, no inherent value produces nothing. It only makes money because people are exchanging it amongst yourselves. He said, it will not have a good end. He's never pressured. No. The man said, look, I don't care what the company is making now. I want to see what they will make in the next 10 years. He said, I never sell shares. He never, he never does. He like trade shares. He said, no. If the price goes down, I'm happy. That you know, maybe you buy Apple stock as an example now, and the price is going up, you are happy. But I'm said, no, if it goes down, that's when I'm happy. He said, why? He said, I'm not planning to sell it. So when it goes down, I buy more. Why? He said, because I know I, it, it researches into the inherent worth. What is the real business they are doing? What are the, he said, look, I'd rather buy houses. He said, if you buy a house, somebody can live in it. He said, if you give me cryptocurrency, I can't use it for anything more than sell it to somebody else. The guy, see, the wisdom he gives to people for investment, you can never follow it. Why? You love money too much. <laughs> you want the money now. Where am I going? So when you see things like that, I say, hey, guys, this money is too quick. That I heard Pastor Bank teach the word of God. He said, it is quick gain. I should hate the idea. He said, go away. Somebody said, invest money. He said, okay. Wait, what business are you going to be doing? How are you going to be helping people? And what am I supposed to be doing? Because a lot of people, my, my friend said that in Lagos, okay, this is long ago, so I don't know what happens now. He said in the market, you know when I talk about drug dealers, he said a lot of the people there are drug dealers. This is in Lagos. He said, I said, what do you mean? He says, they'll just go around. Hey, bring ten, they just go around collecting 10,000 naira. Then after one month, they come and give you 20,000. He said, they all know what they do with it. So most of the drug deals you see is sponsored by the average person in the market. The guy just, ah, man, they need to do one runs. How much do they need? Five million. They just go from shop to shop. Yes. Everybody just contributes some money. And they go away. After one month, you give them 10,000, you give you 20,000. He grew up there, in Lagos Island. He says, all drug. So some of you investment. ask yourself, what are they doing? And I'm telling you, the rules of life are the things I'm talking about. You will say, if I don't know what you are doing, I'm not giving, my, giving, me, giving you my money. If then you double it in two days, it's a satanic money. I don't want. You know, that will save you. God, I'm giving you the glory. Oh, to you be the glory. I have never lost a cobble for these sharp, sharp investment schemes. Not one dime. Never. In my whole life, since I was a student. As a student, I was too afraid. As an older person, I learned enough wisdom to know that this is now you, get, you prosper in life. They come with MMM, that you provide help, then you get help, and your money will double in one month, and you went there. God said, I'm waiting for you in front. I will collect every cobble. You won't get 50 shishi like this. And if you were to get it back, whatever I used to buy, I will spoil it. You give me one million, I'll be giving you 10% every month. So at the end of um, uh, 10 months, I've doubled your money. And he didn't ask me how. And then by the way, if it's too good to be true, you know what? It's usually not true. Now I've told the story of my friend again and again. <laughs> he said, ah, Banky, come. Come, put money. He said, my sister told me about it. I put money. I put $5,000. Now my money is like $12,000. Just a few months. I can't remember the exact figures now. I said, eh. You know, I didn't ask him what he did. I, did, I was not interested. I said, you put money. It has now doubled. Eh? I said, I don't want to put. He said, what is your problem? I said, I don't have a problem. I'm just not interested in doubling my money. Is it by force? It's not my money. I don't want it double. I like it single. <laughs> he said, no, there's nothing to be afraid. This is from America. I said, oh, Ben Amidoff is from America. Ponzi was not a Nigerian. What they call Ponzi, it was not a Nigerian. So why are you making it look? Because somebody, this came, is named after a man, Ponzi. All right? 
Ponzi was made in Nigeria. What are you telling me that is from America? He said, in fact, I remember what I told him very well. I said, guy, you know what? My name is Jonah. If I enter your boat, we are going down. I told him like that. I said, my brother, my name is Jonah. If I enter this boat, I said, she, your, your boat is cruising easily now. Just enjoy it. I said, if I step into the boat, you will lose everything. No? He said, I don't tell you. I said, I don't hear you. So his graph kept on going up. The money kept on going on on graph. It's still on that graph till today. And the woman who moved it, Ruja Ignatova, is believed to have been killed by the mafia after they stole about two to four billion dollars. My friend's money being part of it. You can go and read up the story, one coin story. Ruja Ignatova. The woman disappeared. They are still looking for her. She's on America's FBI most wanted list. His bro- her brother is in jail in America. They were thieves. Criminals. They took most of the money from Africa and Asia. I can't remember whether it's four or two billion dollars that they raked. See, I'm talking about precept. There's defense. See, life has temptations. Precepts were given to keep you from those temptations. Life has temptations. The other day I just told my friend, is, no. listen, if you want to know whether I like $10,000 or I don't, just come, put in an envelope and dash me sincerely and see whether I will cry or laugh. We can do an next. We can even bet. We'll bet with another half, half a million naira. That if I laugh, hmm, you'll get my point. You can take the money. If I cry, I take the money. <laughs> well, bring $10,000. You'll see. Money is a blessing. Amen? Amen. Uh-huh. The love of money is what is bad. And I told myself, God, may I not love money? My friends, I said... What he didn't understand was that I despised the concept of doing anything purely for gain. That, I despised that concept. That this whole thing is just for what I will get out of it. It's so hard for me. I can't see any other thing. That is why I didn't lose money to them. When they say, ah, you put like this. You look. That time in Benin, it was plan well. My wife will remember. They had plan well. They had monetary. Portaco had umana, umana. They had all kinds of things. I would just walk. don't think I had money. I was just walk. I wasn't. I remember my friend. He would come that time. He said, "Banky, we're going to put 500 naira." After two months, it becomes um, 1,000. They will put it back. After two months, it becomes 2,000. He said, "By December, we buy view boots." <laughs> I can never forget. He said, "By December, we buy view boots." It was a joke that time. <laughs> of course, one day everything just went quiet. Bam. By December, we're not talking about it. Precept. Someone walks up to you, that's what will save you from losing your money. That's what I'm saying. It will save you from losing your money. Warren Buffett said, I won't invest in anything that I can't explain to my mother what they do. That is, I have to understand it so well, I can explain. I have to see the value you are contributing into the people who patronize you. That's what precepts do for you. Save you out of all these troubles and headaches. Let me just explain this. I read the, maybe next time I'll talk about that because um, we have not finished. Because last time I ended by saying something, but I'll get to that in a moment. Let me quickly summarize this one I was saying along the line. When you want to make decisions, like I said, please, I, I keep on saying because people sometimes misquote me. God speaks supernaturally, amen? amen? But that's not how he leads most times. If you have not read my book, Guided by the Spirit, please go and read. It is free to download. Most times God will lead you, you will make rational decisions. What did I say? That's it. You will just look, is this good, is this bad? That's all. Now, the important thing, however, is who is making the decision. The kind of heart you have and the kind of information how you is called mind. In the Bible, it's called mind. What is mind? How you decode what you see. I hope you get my point. Or no, more like how you interpret. Yeah, that's a better expression. How you interpret the information given to you is called mind. Do you follow? Like now, I have this face towel here. It's white. What does that mean? That's what it's called mind. It could mean to you if you are coming from a church where white handkerchiefs mean you are anointed. You know, I may say Pastor Bank is specially anointed. The only reason why this thing is white is just because that's the one I have. 
No other reason. I know when we want to dash you this, they give you white. So I have a pile of white handkerchiefs. I, I don't like white because once you wipe your face, one it turns to brown. But if it was brown, it's still brown. <laughs> so interpretation you give it for some, it's just oh no, it's just about um, it just looks nice. <laughs> for some, oh no, it shows it's anointed. <laughs> it's in what they prayed over. Just that thing, it can mean many things, and that's how life is. Every that, that's what you talk about um, profiling, racial profiling. Okay, you, you can't help it. It's an experience that will change it. If every time you see a, you're a white man, every time you see a black man, you get richer. Next time you see a black man, you will hug him. Do you get my point? He's, they don't have to tell you, don't, 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 don't be prejudiced. All this fight, don't be prejudiced. You cannot live life without prejudice. How do you know a madman on the road? It's prejudice. It's pure prejudice. After all these days, now we are seeing that a lot of same people are also wearing rag. So the fact that I'm wearing rag does not mean I'm mad. Now this, that's the argument they're trying to have in some countries now. That one video I saw the other day, they said, welcome man. I said, how can you call me man? I said, you look like a man. I'm not man. What if I identify as a, as a man? He said, but you look like a woman. I said, no, that's not. You see what I mean? You are prejudging me. Ah. The guy said, you look like a woman. Oh, would you learn anything? I'm not planning to learn. You're a woman. So we can't live life without you know, prejudging. Now, that's just, I mean, I'm not saying you should prejudge people badly. But you have to, I mean, like, you just, it's a matter of fact. You judge things, otherwise you're going to get into trouble. You get my point? You see boys looking real terrible and they, their hands under their shirt like this. And you're walking alone at night with a good necklace and expensive phone in your hand. And you don't prejudge them. Okay, don't worry. They are going to soon prejudge your necklace and prejudge your phone. <laughs> now, so anyway, that's what is called mind. That's what I'm going to. That's what is called mind. What does something imply? Do you understand? To you. Now, so you train your mind. You train your mind as you are growing up. Let's take an example about wife and husband. You're a single man. Your mind must be trained to say charm or favor. Is deceitful. And beauty, beauty is what? Vain. It's vanity. It fades. It means nothing. It can be bought in a shop, can be lost overnight. So you train your mind. So you're a single man. The idea is this woman is fine or not fine will not be the reason you want to marry or you don't want to marry. And the Bible says the the woman who does what? Fears. Fears God shall be praised. So that's what I mean. So, like I gave it last time. If a woman is not a believer, you don't pray about it. If you're a woman, the same thing. A man wants to marry you. Don't pray, God, should I marry him or not? That prayer is not yet necessary. First, investigate. And, okay, you can pray about this to know whether he's a genuine Christian or is not. Because when people come to church to deceive you, you can pray and say, look, is this brother serious? Now, God has not said to you whether you should marry him or not. You just want to know, is he a true believer or is not? I hope you're getting my point. <laughs> so, that, Because if, he, if you find out that he is not, God forbids you from coming to ask him whether you should marry the person. You're not allowed to ask. Yeah, you're not allowed to ask. Because to ask means that there's a potential yes. So you are asking God, break the rules of scripture. And God says, why would you ask me to do that? Please, I hope you are getting my point. So most decisions are made with the knowledge of precepts. And let me tell you this as a matter of fact. Maybe 80 or more percent of the times, if you analyze the precepts, you know the right thing. Do you get what I'm saying? 80% 80% of the times, if you analyze the precepts, you will know what is right to do. You won't need any other, uh, any, no. Just by analysis of the circumstances and the information you have using precepts. What are precepts? Just the guiding rules of scripture. I've just given two now. Be not unequally yoked with an unbeliever. I've given another one. Charm is deceitful, beauty is vain. That's another one. I hope you're getting my point. Give offense neither to Jews or to Gentiles, to the church of God. That is, 
no matter what natural tribe you are from, if you're truly a Christian, we're all of one tribe. You understand? These are the things you put together. And then, you not, believe me, half of the times in marriage matters, you've, you've knocked people off. You've, that is, you've solved half of the problems. Now, let me say this to you again. The ones you don't know, most times what God does, I'm saying this from experience, I'm not quoting scripture, is that he gives you more information to allow you to use the precepts you have to come to a rational decision. Now, let me say something to us quickly. Let's understand what God is doing. Hmm? God is trying to form us. Now, please get what I want to say clear. Don't misunderstand me. God is trying to form you into somebody who can be God to somebody else. Did you hear what I said? God wants to train you until you are the type of person they can come to and ask for the mind of God. And he left one man in the scriptures for us like that as an example. Ahitophel. Ahitophel has so much wisdom that the Bible says if you sought counsel from his mouth, it's as if you have asked from God. And he was not using inspiration. No. He was just using you know, calculations. Thank you. He just analyzed the situation. He was so good the day they disobeyed his instruction. He knew where the end would be. The man was too good. They said, look, yo, look, Absalom, we've deposed your father, right? Now this is the time to end this deal. Go after him now. Ah, is it Hushai came and said, no, that, that one is not good. I had to fail, look at them, I said. And I don't know whether in life, once you grow, you know, as you're growing older, you'll be watching people make mistakes. And if you want to say, this is what I do. I know where it's going to end. But you know they won't listen to you. You just say it in person and you wait. Then you give them like one week. At the end of one week, they come ahead. This is the current situation. And you now quickly remind it, this is what you said last time. So now let me help you from here. Now you have become the Ahitophel. Because they don't have, and it wasn't like you were praying. And the thing is, okay, let me give you an example. When they were doing MMM in Nigeria, for those of us who have lived long enough, when they were doing MMM, we said it will soon end. I think I even said it on radio. I just use code to say it on, on word versus word. Yeah. I did not know it was already end. That is like, as I was saying it, it had already begun to wind down. So less than three weeks after I said that and openly, the thing shut down. And we were like, hey, I lost money. I said, no, no, they always lose money. See, we have seen it again. Now, I hope you know it will come back in about six years, seven years, to come back again. Your mom is never, like, look. I told you recently, I heard that somebody carried money. They, are not, they have not yet told me the end. Many times people are telling me stories. Before the person gets to the end, I tell them the end. That's just the way life is. That's just the way life is. You just tell people, look, this way it's going to end. And it ends there. Not because you were inspired, particularly, but because by reason of use, you have learned to separate what is good from what is evil. Where am I going? That is where God is taking you to. So that is why he does not impose all the decisions on you. A lot of times he allows you to come to that. It's training. So what he does is that, number one way he helps you therefore is give you more information. He just gives you more information. So let me see what he will do with it. And if you, now, and that's again, one thing you must bear in mind. As Christians, we must be constant disciples. Always learning. It's not when you are in trouble, you go and learn precepts. Learn precepts whether you need them or not. It's part of growing up. It's part of growing up. It is not when you need. It's just part of life. You just keep learning it. Because sometimes, somebody else beside you is the one that needs help. And you just tell the person, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. So number one way, God helps you when you are unable to make important decisions based on what you know, is to give you more information, give you more knowledge. He keeps training you. It's only occasionally. And because it's urgent, you have used everything you know. Yet you cannot come to a final decision that is pleasing to God. You will now say, if anyone lacks wisdom, do you get my point? Now where am I going? God will now come help you not teaching you, but just give you a direct, don't do. Don't or do. It's only occasionally. You now look, sometimes it's a counsel of a friend. Sometimes it's a prophetic word that comes as you are listening to the word of God being taught. 
Sometimes you have a dream. Sometimes an angel will walk in and tell you what God said. Sometimes a prophet will come and call you and say, God said that she will tell you. Do you get what I'm trying to say? You don't live your life based on that. Those things come in less than 10% of the times you have to make decisions. There's defense in what? Precepts. There's defense in precepts. Now let me just add this one to it and I, I run off. That's what they call it. I call it the traps of Satan and traps of the world. I'm going to explain that and then we'll close. Now I, I read the Beatitudes. My, that's where we began from. But I've not really gone back to explaining them. Okay, let me just mention something briefly. See, those Beatitudes we read, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, are foundational precepts for Christians. Are you getting my point? Blessed are the poor in spirit. We talked about it some time ago. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? What does it mean? It means to recognize your need in life for advancement in the knowledge of God as an example. So you walk by it all the time, always seeking to learn, always seeking to know. Knowing that where you are now is not where you are supposed to be. We've talked about blessed are the humble. Let's not go over that again. But Jesus talked about it. Better the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Now, please, I don't want to focus now on the blessings. I want to focus on the person. We are supposed to be meek. We are supposed to love. He said, blessed are those who do us, who thirst and hunger after righteousness. That this, it must be something you, your intense desire must be to know that which is pleasing to God and to do it. Now, let, I'm just summarizing that. Those are the precepts. These are the precepts of life that God says we should walk by. But you know, I said I want to talk about the traps. Trap of Satan and trap of the world. Please, I'll end with that. In fact, let me just put up everything so that you know that I'm serious. All right? <laughs> The trap of Satan and trap of the world. Please, I say this all the time. The devil is not as powerful as we make him to appear. We're talking about him too much. Too many times we're talking about what he's doing. He's not that powerful. Please remember, he has a few powers. Things that God has granted to him. One, he tempts. He's, very, he's a very good tempter. He's so good that he will eventually win against each person, were it not that God limited the amount of temptation he can give you. Yeah, God does not allow him to tempt you more than you're able to bear. The t- his temptations are limited. Anyone that God allows to come, you can handle it. But many times you don't handle it because you have been negligent in building yourself to the handling position. I hope you're getting my point. Yeah. But actually God says this is something you should be able to handle. But he's so good with temptation. Hmm? He's so good that way not that God limits his power. You catch him almost everybody. So that's the first thing he has. Please remember that. Okay? Number two, he knows how to, as part of temptation, his job is to deceive. He doesn't try to kill you directly. He doesn't have a gun. And if he were to have a gun, if he shoots, he will miss. What he does is to tempt and try to deceive. If you see, what did he do to Eve? The temptation was true deception. I hope you're getting my point. Yeah. Third, once you are falling for his temptation, he goes to accuse before God the judge. Because our father is a different function he has as father. But when he sits as judge, Satan is allowed to come. Then, if judgment is passed against the person he's accusing, then he gets the power of death against that individual. That's the way it works. I hope you get my point. He gets the power of death against that individual. Where am I going? Having said this, the world, you know I said that defense in what? Precepts. Satan, listen to this I want to say. Satan wants to miss your destiny. We said it before. What is Satan doing now? One, the first time he didn't want his son to come. He tried to corrupt the lineage so that the son of God would not be born, Jesus Christ. Now Jesus has been born he has done what he is supposed to do. So what is Satan doing now to make sure he doesn't come again? Two com- comings. The first one has passed. There are two more. Two more. The first two, this, of this latter two, all right, the initial one is him coming in you. You becoming like the sun. So he doesn't want the sun inside you to manifest. That's second. Then That's first. The second one is the final coming of Jesus Christ. He wants to delay it as long as possible. And it will be delayed. 
as long as certain criteria are not met. He doesn't just show up all of a sudden. He gave criteria. Let me give you an example. This gospel of the kingdom was preached to the ends of the world as a witness to the nations. All the harvests must be reaped. All the remnants must come in. There are things that must be fulfilled. And Satan, knowing that his time is short, he goes out with vengeance. Why? He's trying to extend the time. Basically, Satan is working hard. He's, he's, he's working hard. And one of the things he tries to do is to displace you and me from our positions in life. If God says, stay here. He say, don't stay. Leave. And you read it through the scriptures. That's what happens. Stay here. You are busy here and there. You are not where you are supposed to be. Now, wh- why am I going to all of this? That's all Satan can do. He can't do more than tempt you out of, let me use the expression, alignment. He can't tempt you more than make sure you shift. That he can't do more than tempt you so that you will shift out of where you are supposed to be so that you will contribute what you are supposed to contribute into the coming of the Lord. That's all he can do. Basically, if we don't cooperate... He fails. He has failed. If we, the only thing he's hoping on is that these people will fall for my temptation. Please don't forget that. And that's all the world is doing. They are working for Satan. That's all Satan is doing. What is the defense? That's the point I'm making. The defense is, is not in, oh God, I'm back to it. I pray that God spoke to me. No. God has spoken to people to leave the place where he said they should be. If you know what I mean. They heard God and they abandoned their duty post. But it wasn't God. It was Satan. In fact, I've been listening to a lot of prophets and teachers of the word. And they kept emphasizing how... In fact, Ken Hagen will tell you that he has seen it before. A prophet will manifest the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of God in prophecy in one moment. Five minutes down the line, he's operating familiar spirits. There's one particular prophet who I mentioned his name a lot. I won't mention it so as not to cause confusion. I heard one preacher say recently, he mentioned his name. It's long ago. He's not alive now. He said this man was a very powerful prophet in the body of Christ. He said, but his, one of his close associates confided in him and said he had two spirits. That at times he turns and is prophesying by familiar spirits. Oh, yes. It makes me very careful. Look, when I tell you things, I know I'm telling you, I'm warning you. You can't be following prophecies and following this thing. You have to follow the word of God first. That is the only defense you have. It's only, it's, look, prophetic words, no. You won't gain anything. If you don't learn the word first, a prophet may be helping you now. You will not know when he will switch to using familiar spirits. That is why it is forbidden. Now, I need to say this. It is forbidden of you to rely on any prophet. To make decisions for everything in your life. It's forbidden. If you do that, God will allow evil spirits to that guy. He's going to lie to you. You, be building your life on God's word regularly. The day God needs to use a prophet, he will. Not, your daughter wants to marry. Eh, so Amaka, you want to marry? Okay, come, let us go. And you now come and meet me that I should pray. Whether this is the right husband. <laughs> Maggie. <laughs> You can't come to me to be verifying whether you should marry this person or not. So now come and become prayer contractor. Now, for those of you who are pastors, that thing makes money. You have to make money. Before they come, they post a seat down. You have to activate the unction. You bring venison for prophecy. Yes. So what have you brought? What, what, what do you offer? You put it down, 100K. We will hear God correctly, not a problem. If money is small... Two five. What do you want God to say on two five? <laughs> say, Pastor, that's what we have. No, 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 no. The Lord cannot speak like this. Then you go and bring more add to it. Please. You don't need that's not what you use prophets for. Please. You don't drag people. Please listen to me as Christians. We are allowed to ask for counsel. What the pastor does is to instruct you with the word of God. Not to close his eyes and check what God is saying. That's divination. And we have to be careful that we don't push our prophets into divination. I hope I'm clear. Now, let me say this. Like I said, I'll say it and close. Maybe we'll develop it further next time. And this is the point. The only defense you have, that we all have, so that we don't fall for Satan's traps, his precepts. 
we have to take the precepts of God. Maybe next time I'll talk about the gods of the world. Because, you see, when you start disobeying God's precepts, you fall into idolatry you don't know. We start worshipping another god. We start worshipping another god. Let me give you an example. You know, this is a very, very simple one. Don't worry about tomorrow. The world teaches us to worry about tomorrow. Pastors come to church to teach how to worry about tomorrow. We bring people to come in to help us worry about tomorrow. We call them planners, retirement planners. We call them all kinds of names. All they do is teach us how to worry about tomorrow. Don't lay up treasure on the earth. Jesus gave it not as a word of counsel, but as a direct instruction. You know, we go to church and teach how to lay... Look, when all those MMM things were going on, there are no churches that the pastors were telling people how to enter. I know churches that started their own. One of my brethren told me that in their house. eh? In fact, the children came and said, give us money so we can go and register on that pastor. It's Satan that entered. A pastor should have, let them, he should have known that this is idolatry you are bringing in. Listen, the only way we will shut Satan out of our churches is if we, if we stick with the precepts of God. Please, let me say this to us again. Satan is not going to come looking like an evil person. The most evil Satan in the world is very handsome, he's well-dressed, and he's anointed to preach. Yeah, they are the ones you let him subtly, not knowing. That's why you need to test apostles to find out whether they are apostles. Not they just wear a fine suit and run into your congregation. Because they can raise money, you let them preach. You pastors, anybody that is good at raising money, before you let them into your church, you have to pray double and beg him, don't raise money, just preach. Once you start bringing in money raisers into your church, that congregation will have demons. You can't help it. You don't understand. You cannot help it. Demons will come. Say, we need money. Who do we invite? Says Pastor Dami. <laughs> I like the way he rejected it. God, be me. Not even joke near that area. You are the one they start calling when they need money. Look, before the end of the year, you have familiar spirits. You don't have to ask for that. They will jump on you. Say, Pastor, we are going to raise money, Abby. Can we come? <laughs> you just enter the church. Now say, I see one woman here. You came with... Next thing you know, they are talking to you. Ah, you're like, how did I know this? You just came on me suddenly. <laughs> how do we keep Satan out? That's the summary of what I'm going to say. Is precepts. Is the precepts of God. Is the precepts of God. When God says something, yeah, th- yeah, okay, and I know what I really wanted to say. Thank you, Father. I know what I really wanted to say. Please, and please, this is the last thing I'm going to say, and then we're going. <laughs> if you laugh, I will say two more things. Oh, you are still laughing? <laughs> please, this is where I was going. So I told something to my channel a few days ago in the morning. I said, don't get used to making excuses for disobeying. Be embarrassed to have to give an excuse for disobedience. Even if the excuse is genuine. Just be embarrassed. They have to explain. Let me give an example. It rained this morning, right? Okay. Now, please, I'm not, this is not an attack on anybody. I assume you're supposed to get here by 8 o'clock. All right? Now, this is what the average person does. Once it starts raining, we relax. You know why? Because in your mind, I will get there by 8.30. I want to know God says, why are you just coming? You will say, it rained. Do you understand? Now, are you lying? No. Maybe the rain was so heavy that you couldn't get transport. It's possible. I said, but don't feel comfortable. That's what I was teaching them. Be embarrassed. You should come in there and say, ah, bro, she became, sorry, I'm just coming. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Not, ah, you saw it rain though. No. It's more like, I'm so sorry, I'm 30 minutes late. I'm I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. There isn't be the one to make an excuse about the rain. I'm really sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. You should be embarrassed that, listen, I'm 30 minutes late. Not that, you can see the rain, though. It's not raining in your own part of Enugu. I'm coming from Ziggs Avenue, and it rained there. And you are throwing it now. You're not lying, but you are getting used to disobedience. And that's what I'm attacking. You are not lying, but you are beginning to find comfort in the midst of disobedience. You should be jittery when you get the 8.30. Kai, 
I was supposed to get it. Ah, next time I'm entering that ring, I'm going to buy rain boots. I am going to get a raincoat. Oh, no, 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 no. I won't let this happen again. I told the story of the young man who was resuming work in America, in Texas, who trekked. He woke up, I can't remember when he started. He supposed to report me by 8 o'clock in the morning. He didn't have his own car. If you know the way Texas is, most of America is like that. If you don't have your own car, it's a hard life. Because most of them, they don't have good train systems. And unlike Europe, where you have trains and buses, they don't have them in America, in most places. You have to own a car. It's the only way you get around. Okay? So, <laughs> this guy, knowing he didn't have a car, he started trekking by like 3 a.m. He woke up, dressed up, wore his uh, sneakers, and started walking to work. When you are walking at such an odd time, policeman will stop you somewhere along the line. Policeman pulled him over. Well, hey, boy, come. Where are you going? Why are you out at this time of the night? Sir, it's my first day at work. I can't afford to be late. Policeman put him in the vehicle and drove him to the edge of his jurisdiction and dropped him. He got to work. He had trekked. The boss looked at him. Why are you looking like this? He came very early. He was there on time. But the guy was very happy. Oh, this is a young black man. This is a white neighborhood. Oh, you're, you're here. Very good. Huh? Along the line. The gist came out that the guy, he didn't have money. He couldn't take taxi, nothing. When the boss found out, the guy just looked for one car he had. He wasn't using He said, this is now your car. He dashed the boy car at the end of the first day at work. Just to explain, please, stop looking for excuses to skirt around precepts. Labor to obey the precepts. That's why I want to end it. Stop looking for excuses to bend them because this thing was given for your protection. Stop looking for how you will do what God said you, will not, you should not do. No matter how little it looks, pray until God helps you see it. There's something I used to tell women those days. If I remember one day, one of our sisters said, I was teaching, all right? I was at, um, at TCC. They had a uh, couple's program, marriage program. I was teaching. And I explained something to the ladies. I said, see, hmm? Now, this is life, not just about ladies. It's just life. Everything has its risks. For example, if you are very rich and you are connected, there's a risk you become proud. It's not, you're not evil. That's just the way it is. You want to spend money on everything. You want to cause trouble because, you know, the worst they will do is to find you. Do you get my point? It's, it's just an unconscious thing in your mind. No, be fine. We we'll go pay. There's one famous musician in the UK. They say no parking. And her gym is nearby. She's very rich. Of course, you know, these are multi-millionaires. Very, very well to do. So you know what she does? Every day she parks there. Goes to the gym and does her workout. And she comes out, she pays the fine. Now if you're a Christian, let me just warn you, God will be angry with you if you do that. That no parking was not given for money raising. The money was supposed to be a deterrent. But you are now so rich, you have become proud. You are taking the name of the Lord in vain. What she used to do, every day she comes, she parks there, right in front of the gym, and goes in. The policeman was now used to her. One, he has his ticket ready. Once she parks, he puts the ticket there. She went out the gym, walked out, got out the ticket at the end of the week, pays everything off. It's pride. It's a risk to being rich. Now, please, back to the priest that I wanted to give us an example. The risk to familiarity is disrespect. That is a major problem in marriages. The woman is so familiar with, to the, with the man that to respect him the way she respects her boss is humanly not possible. But that is the problem. That day I was teaching, that day we said we are at TCC. One of our sisters said that. So I'll just explain some things. She now explained that, look, of course your husband... Is your friend? Is your, is your husband? Is your husband is one word that has 17 things inside. In fact, 25. All kinds of things inside it. This guy is a boyfriend. It's part of it. Do you understand my point? Uh-huh. So, like she said that day, he does things the boss cannot do. So basically, so he ends disrespect, like shaking you above the shoulder. You know, the handshake crossing shoulder. If the boss shakes you, the hand is reaching his... What's he reaching here? Oga, are you okay? <laughs> uh, I'm just shaking you. Kick him somewhere. He did find my point ahead. <laughs> but if he's a husband, he's allowed to do that. Shake you, shake you, shake you. you know, let me not put my hand beyond that. <laughs> Please. Do you understand my point? <laughs> so, <laughs> 
Now, that breeds disregard. It breeds disrespect. It does. Not because you are wicked, but because you are human. I've told a story before of one, uh, one king. Is it, is it a laughing? One a laughing of Oyo? Because this is, I mean, no, Oyo Empire was a massive empire. All right? So the laughing was the emperor. So he married a young wife. And the young wife was, they were playing, you know, he was maybe rubbing his back, having a bath, giving him a bath. And he was a small guy. He wasn't tall like the tall reverend. You know, there's a way Hercules is a king. You know why he's king. When you see his size. <laughs> but when you see a small man who's king, so the woman now says, ah, Bale me. That's my husband. So it says they fear you like this. Why are they afraid of you? Is this not all, all of you? Now the guy come out of the bathroom. <laughs> Call, <laughs> Called his chief bodyguard. Her father was a very influential man in the society. He said, go to her house, behead him, and bring his head on a platter. The guy left, went to the girl's house, brought her the father, beheaded him, put his head on the platter, and came and gave to the king. So the king dropped it for her. He said, that's why everybody fears me. What he did was not good because actually they deposed him after some time. And they had to depose the king that his rule was too bad. But where I'm going, that story, all right, it struck me because he said to the woman, oh, you want to know why they fear me? I will show you. It's not a good thing. I'm not saying it's good. It's the woman I want to talk about. You are giving the king a bath. Shut your mouth. He says, your husband does not give you the right to talk nonsense. He's still the king. I'll give you a simple example. You know, our brother... All right? He's the Attorney General of Enugu State. He's my younger brother. You understand? He honors and respects me. But if I enter the office, I will jokingly say, Your Excellency! He will get up and laugh. But I will not show him any disrespect in front of his staff just because he's my younger brother. These are little, little things people don't know in life. I said, So everything has his what? His risks. So if you're a woman, you've married, the risk is that you will disrespect this guy. So you know what you do? You wake up every morning and train yourself that I must not break this precept. And like I tell my wife, so you have to understand, I'm your prophet, I'm your pastor, I'm your leader. I'm not your friend first. Friend is down the line. Yeah. This boyfriend thing is like number six. These are the ones I've mentioned. Anointing does not flow from boyfriend. Anointing doesn't flow from boyfriend. Boyfriend can't lay hands on you. Receive it and you get anything. You won't get anything. What is it? You can only get pregnant. You can only pregnant. get pregnant. Thank you. <laughs> but the anointing comes from pastor. It comes from the prophet. The God speaks. So you have to train your... Now, please, that's where I'm going. You have to train yourself. Don't make excuses. They say, this is Nigeria. Don't make excuses. This is not Nigeria. This is the kingdom of God. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I just use that marriage as an example. You don't make excuses for disobedience. You know why? You are falling into the trap of Satan. The world gives you reasons to disobey precepts. Don't ever fall for those reasons. Please, I'm not saying it will be easy. I'm just saying, you know what Paul said to Timothy? Physical exercise has a little bit. But godliness is profitable all things. So he told him, exercise yourself for the purpose of godliness. It's training. You are a Nigerian policeman of today, and they put you to man a checkpoint, and you are five in the checkpoints. And you say you won't call it Roger. It's not you I'm talking about, it's your four colleagues. How do you handle your matter? How should you handle it? I'm not going to discuss it. But you will not say it's Nigeria, I will collect. You will go and pray and say, God, how do I handle it? How do I handle my friends? I won't discuss how. I don't want to go into that area. Because I probably don't even know. I've never walked there. I don't know the pressures. I don't know what the rules are. I don't. But as a Christian, you will say, I can't. So what do I do? I go and pray until God gives me the wisdom. That's the thing I want to end that portion with. Remember, the precepts of what we are talking about, I ended that last time with it. They are not hard things. So. That the rules are straightforward. But applying them can be difficult. Like I told you, maybe you have a landlord that tells you, Cause your car, you saved for some time, borrowed money with a little bit of bank loan to buy this car. And this man called it Jalopy. Who 
people get this old jalugbo in park for here? The normal thing is, Oga, okay, warn yourself. Because I'm a tenor, doesn't mean I'm inferior to you, so I give him lecture. Why do you give your seniors lecture? I don't know why people do that. You'll be, you be giving lecture to your senior. That thing you did, is that the right thing you're supposed to handle it? Please, can I beg you, don't ever lecture your seniors. That's not what you're supposed to do. Somebody in your position, ah. If you talk to me like that, I'll be looking at you like this. If, if God gives me the grace, I will slap you. That is that if you are young enough, so that I'll just beat you. For your own good. So you're good. You are not allowed. To, people don't know that. You're not allowed to lecture your senior. You see people because they're angry. No, sir. Let me just say what is in my mind. See? You don't do that. You calm yourself down. Tell the man, landlord, hey, God bless you, sir. He's Jalopi today. He's a Bugatti tomorrow. This is a seed. The harvest is a Maybach. You're angry on the surface. You say it like that. It's called training. You train yourself. That's what I'm going to. Don't give excuses to break precepts. Don't use excuses to break precepts. Fight until you obey and align. You know why? That way you are shutting out Satan out of your life. That way you are making sure that you are protected. Remember, there's defense in precepts. Next time, God helping me, I'll go over some of these precepts. Simple things like the ones we read from the Beatitudes. Meanwhile, let's just give a lot of thanks. Say, Father, thank you for today. I hope you've learned something. Say, Lord, thank you. You've taught me. Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Give the Lord thanks for that.